Greetings, everyone. I've uh, taken you as uh, far as the calendar and the uh, course material will allow me to do this. Uh, hopefully, you've uh, learned a, a thing or two from the course to uh, enrich your uh, enrich your career. Uh, and it's like like I said uh, earlier on, as I, I think was thinking about this. It's good to see, you know, in regard to a course like this, it's good to see uh, why things uh, do not happen in vacuums, right? And I've often said this too, I haven't said it in this course, but um, that the, you know, the college education in, in general, even if you don't earn a dime from it, uh, it's uh, worth it all in, the, in the, uh, the long run because of the overall mind expansion and introduction to new ideas and and uh, new ways of, of uh, thinking, which leads to this uh, this last chapter, right? this last chapter. And, and there haven't been too many phenomena that have had uh, the effect on uh, a good chunk of the world, a good chunk of the world, uh, as did the Black Death, as did the Black Death. Uh, it did everything uh, from destroy social orders to lead folk to take on ocean voyages just to get off the, the uh, European continent. It helped spawn uh, new religious movements, uh, as well as lead people to to question some of the existing ones. And I suppose there, I'm probably talking about uh, Christianity and we'll get into that here in a few minutes. But this, this era, this last era we're gonna be taking a look at for this section of the course, experiences a return to um, trade networks and campaigns to uh, convert the unbelievers or the unwashed and speaking here predominantly of Christianity and Islam that uh, were involved in these, for lack of a better way to say it, these evangelistic campaigns. We also see the emergence of uh, dynasties, albeit they have their, uh, they have their different flavor. Um, they establish their rule by developing formidable militaries, uh, to help maintain stable borders. Uh, rule was cemented uh, via dynastic marriage. And, and, and even there, you know, there was not much of a choice uh, of uh, who you were going to marry. Uh, so it may be uh, one step up, if that, from, you know, an arranged marriage. Turn to page 531, we'll take a look, start to take a look at the, um, where we're gonna be going with this. And um, some uh, heads up terms here. There we go. Whoops. Share the sound here. There we go. So here in um, this particular chapter, we want to describe the nature and uh, the origins of the crisis spanning Afro-Eurasia during the 14th century and um, assess the impact of the Black Death on China, the Islamic world, and uh, in Europe. Uh, if you're thinking that that sounds a lot like maybe the pandemic of COVID, it's probably, um, probably an, accurate, um, an accurate comparison there. Uh, compare the ways in which regional rulers in the post-plague uh, Afro-Eurasia attempted to construct unified states and analyze the extent uh, of the nature. Oops, where did I go with that? Wanted to make a change there on a um, misspelling, and I knocked myself 
clean down to the uh, to another galaxy. So, and analyze the ex the extent and nature of their successes. We want to explain the role that religious belief systems played in rebuilding the Islamic world, Europe, and Ming China in the 14th and 15th centuries. And we will examine the way art and uh, architecture reflected the political realities of the Islamic world, Europe, Ming China after the Black Death, as well as compare how Ottoman, Iberian, and Ming rulers extended their territories and regional influence. Heads up terms here, <clears throat> the Black Death, plague pandemic that ravaged Europe, East Asia and North Africa in the 14th century, killing large numbers of people, including perhaps as much as one third of the European population. Dynasty, hereditary ruling family that passed control from one generation to the next. The Ottoman Empire, a Turkish warrior band that transformed itself into a vast multicultural bureaucratic empire that lasted from the early 14th century and encompassed Anatolia, the Arab world, and large swaths of Southern and uh, Eastern Europe. The Topkapi Palace, palace complex located in Istanbul that served as both the residence of the Sultan along with his harem and larger household and the political headquarters of the Ottoman Empire. The Dedef Shrine, the Ottoman Empire, its system of taking non-Muslim children in place of taxes in order to educate them in the Muslim ways and prepare them for service in the Sultan's bureaucracy. Monarchy, political system in which one individual holds power and passes that power on to his next of kin. The Inquisition, general term for a tribunal of the Roman Catholic Church that enforced religious orthodoxy. Several Inquisitions, see if I can do this without knocking myself into another galaxy, took place over the centuries, seeking to punish heretics, witches, Jews and those whose conversion, Christianity was called into doubt. The Renaissance, a term meaning rebirth, used by historians to characterize the cultural flourishing of the European nations between 1430 and 1550, which emphasized a break from church-centered medieval world and a new concept of humankind as the center of the world. Humanism, the Renaissance aspiration to develop a greater understanding of the human experience that the Christian scriptures offered by reaching back in the ancient Greek and Roman texts. Printing press, a machine used to print text or pictures from type or plates, uh, dramatically increasing the speed at which information can be copied and disseminated. The spread of the printing press technology in the 1450s created a revolution in communication around the globe. The Ming Dynasty, successor to the Mongol Yuan Dynasty that reinstituted and reinforced Han Chinese ceremonies and ideals including rule by an ethnically on bureaucracy. Red Turban Movement, diverse religious movement in China during the 14th century that spread the belief that the world was drawing to an end as Mogul rule was collapsing. Xiang He, Ming naval commander who from 1405 to 1433 led seven massive naval expeditions to impress other peoples with Ming might and to establish tributary relations with Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean ports, the Persian Gulf, and Africa.
Okay. So let's um, shift gears here and get into uh, the actual lecture. We'll get right to the Black Death. So chapter 11, crisis and recovery in Afro-Eurasia. Uh, you could turn to page 531. 533, I, I, I guess I'm gonna start off, uh, I'll start off there. Um, collapse and consolidation, the spread of the, uh, the Black Death. Um, well, so, if, you know, the question, how did the Black Death move so far and so fast? Uh, one explanation may lie in the climate changes. Uh, the cooler climate in this period, scholars referred to as a little ice age, may have weakened populations actually and left them vulnerable to disease. In Europe, for instance, uh, beginning around 1310, uh, harsh winters and rainy summers, uh, shortened growing seasons and ruined the harvest. So exhausted soils uh, no longer supplied the resources required by growing urban and rural populations, while nobles squeeze the peasantry in an effort to maintain their luxurious lifestyle. So the ensuing famine lasted from 1315 to 1322, during which time millions of Europeans died of starvation or of diseases against which the malnourished population had little resistance. Climate change and famine crippled populations on the eve of the Black Death Climate change too uh, spread drought across Central Asia where a bubonic plague had lurked for centuries. So when steppe peoples migrated in search of new pa pastures and herds, they were carrying these germs with them and into contact with more densely populated agricultural communities. Rats also joined the exodus from the arid lands and then transmitted fleas to other rodents which then, you know, skip to humans. And basically, if you take a look at um, map 11.1 1, uh, in your textbooks, you could see where the, um, was, this was all exacerbated along trade routes. People didn't know that at first and people were leaving the continent, getting on, you know, uh, high risk, um, ocean voyages to, because people didn't know, you know the rhyme or reason to the uh, path of the bubonic plague, Black Death. And, uh, but later on in hindsight, we could see that uh, it followed, you know, out of the Black Sea and along trade routes. It uh, affected, you know, China, popular religious movements uh, uh, warned of impending doom there. Uh, the most prominent was the Red Turban Movement which uh, blended China's diverse cultural and religious traditions, including Buddhism, uh, Taoism, and other faiths. So in China, its leaders emphasized strict dietary restrictions, uh, penance, and ceremonial rituals, and made proclamations that the world was drawing to an end. Uh, the plague hit the Islamic world, uh, the plague in Europe, uh, in Europe, uh, for the many who survived the plague, they were disappointed with the clergy. So disappointment with the clergy began to, um, to smolder. And uh, you can take a look at the map over on, um, where is that? Page 536 and 537. Western Christendom. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, famine and plague, the peoples of Western Christendom, like those in the Muslim world, look to their religious beliefs and institutions as foundations for recovery. So the faith of many had been severely tested through this and religious authorities had to struggle to reclaim their power. Disappointment with the clergy, like I said, that smoldered. Uh, 
And this response included the persecution of Jews, Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and, and Portugal, uh, gays, sex workers uh, as well, and others considered by the church to be heretics. So during this period, the church also expanded its charitable and uh, bureaucratic functions, providing alms to uh, the urban poor and registering births, deaths, and uh, economic uh, transactions as, uh, as well. Uh, Europe's political rulers align themselves with church leaders to rebuild their states and uh, consolidate, uh, consolidate their power. Uh, in 1450, Western Christendom had no central government, no official tongue, and only a few successful commercial centers. So mostly in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, map 11.3, you can look at uh, the feudal system of a Lord's control over the peasantry. We looked at that back in chapter 10, which was now in decline, uh, left a legacy of political fragmentation and enduring elite privileges which made the consolidation of a unified Christian Europe even more difficult to achieve. Uh, Europe's linguistic, di linguistic diversity reflected this political fragmentation as well. So basically no single ruler or language unites the people, peoples in uh, Western Europe, uh, even though they um, shared a, um, oh, a, common religion together. I should probably say something about the monarchy too. Uh, the political institutions of monarchy was uh, particularly instrumental to Western Christendom in the um, 15th century as well. Then you have state building and uh, economic, uh, economic recovery. You have uh, Europe's rulers attempting to rebuild and consolidate power. I wanna talk here about the um, printing press and one of the major one of the major technological advances was the invention of the printing press. And that's what served to increase the spread of knowledge more than any other phenomenon. And you can, I do this in some of my classes uh, for, uh, in Western civilization. We, you know, when we look at the reformation and how the printing press really um, made that happen. And you know, what's more influential, the printing press or, um, the internet today, right? That's always a good discussion. Political consolidation and trade on the Iberian Peninsula. When we talk about the Iberian Peninsula, we're talking about Spain and Portugal. Uh, war and overseas trade played a central role in the emergence of new dynasties in Portugal and Spain. So through the 14th century, uh, Portuguese Christians began devoting themselves to fighting the Moors, who were Muslim occupants of North Africa, the Western Sahara, and uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And through this time, Christians and Muslims were always at war against each other for political and religious reasons, economic reason, uh, reasons as well. <clears throat> Isabella and Ferdinand, they uh, sought to drive all non-Catholics out of Spain. Terrified by Ottoman incursions into Europe, they launched the Inquisition in 1481, uh, taking aim especially against converted Jews and Muslims whom they suspected were Christians and only in name. So strong was the tide of Spanish fervor by late 1491 that the monarchs listened now to a uh, Genoese navigator whose pleas for patronage 
they had previously rejected. Christopher Columbus is who I'm talking about. Uh, he promised them unimaginable riches that could finance their military campaigns and therefore uh, bankroll a crusade to liberate Jerusalem from uh, Muslim hands. The Renaissance. Much later, scholars coined the word Renaissance rebirth to characterize the cultural flourishing of the Italian city-states. France, the Netherlands, England, and the Holy Roman Empire in the period of 1430 to 5, 1550. So what was being reborn? Uh, what was that all about? What was being reborn was ancient Greek and Roman art and learning. Knowledge that can help people understand an expanding world and support the rights of secular individuals to exert that power. Scholarship that attempted to return to Greek and Roman sources became known as humanism. Competing ideas of government, a network of educated men and women who acquired the means to challenge political, clerical, and aesthetic authority. Um, Florentine's Machiavelli wrote the most famous treatise on authoritarian power, The Prince, in 1513, which argued that political leadership was about mastering the immoral means of power and statecraft. Um, Machiavelli's um, philosophy, the ends justifies the means. He believed in a Republican form of government, but if it um, took cutthroat authoritarianism to reach a political goal, then that was the, that was the order of the day. Gradually, not done with the Renaissance yet. Gradually, a network of educated men and women took shape that was not wholly dependent on the church, the state, or any single princely patron. So classical knowledge uh, gave um, individuals the means to challenge political, clerical, and aesthetic authority. Uh, you can see some of the, the Renaissance masterpieces uh, on page 554, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. And over on page 555, the, around 1450, the German goldsmith Johannes Gutenberg inventing the printing press. And you can see a photograph of um, that. In Ming, China. The uh, Mongols brought the Yuan dynasty to power. And then the plague came about and devastated China and prepared a way for the emergence of a new dynasty. The Ming dynasty ruled by ethnically Han Chinese defined itself against its former predecessors. Uh, Ming emperors sought to reinforce everything Chinese. In particular, they supported China's vast internal agricultural markets in an attempt to minimize dependence on merchants and foreign trade. Uh, your authors have an inset in this chapter, you read a little bit more about the current trends in world history section, uh, Ming fashion. You know, I find that interesting. Restoring order, the um, intervention began at the um, hands of a poor young man who had trained in the red turban movement, Zhu Zhuangzang. was um, successful warlord who had led a rebellion against the waning power of the uh, of the warlords during that uh, particular time period and he had led a rebellion also again against the mongols and any others who would assert control uh, in their wake 
Ming rulers faced a formidable challenge at rebuilding cities, restoring respect for rulers and reconstructing the bureaucracy as well. A lot of imperial grandeur and, uh, and kinship. Chinese always say, uh, have always been a very bureaucratic culture. Okay, so building, um, building a bureaucracy. Uh, Hong Wu first sought to rule through kinsmen, but soon established a merit and a civil service exam, you know, based imperial bureaucracy. This is, um, you know, very much Confucian uh, influenced. Ming rulership, and you can turn to page 562 in your textbook, look at the, um, the map there. Uh, Ming stability and centralization was unique compared to the constant warfare you had in Europe. Right. Emperor Hong Wu appointed village chiefs, village elders, or tax captains in order to manage his empire. So the dynasty created a social hierarchy to manage people based on age, sex, and kinship. The Ming stymied threats with outright terror and repression. The empire remained undergoverned because of the immense task for 10,000 to 15,000 officials to manage over 200 million people. One of the reasons why the Chinese were forced to become more administrative and bureaucratic perhaps than other cultures. Emperor Hong Wu's legacy enabled other Ming successors to balance centralized ambitions with local sources of power. trade and exploration under the Ming. The Ming dynasty viewed overseas expansion with suspicion. The Hongwu emperor feared too much contact with the outside world would cause instability and undermine his rule. In fact, he banned private maritime commerce in 1371, but enforcement was lax. And by the late 15th century, maritime trade had once again surged because much of the thriving business took place in defiance of official edicts, constant friction occurred between government officials and maritime rulers. Although the Ming government ultimately agreed to issue licenses for overseas trade in the mid 16th century, its policies continued to vacillate. The expeditions of Zheng He. The name Zheng He, and he lived from 1371 to 1433. Um, he grew up to be an important military leader. So, and he was given that name. He commanded the world's greatest armada and led seven naval expeditions. His larger ship stretched 400 feet in length. When you compare that to Columbus's Santa Maria, which was 85 feet in length. But um, the general ship from one of Zhang He's fleets would carry hundreds of sailors on four tiers or of decks. The first expedition set sail with 28,000 men abo aboard a flotilla. flotilla of um, 62 large ships and over 200 lesser ones. And you can take a look at a couple of things there, page 564, there's one of a uh, kind of a model drawing of one of Xing He's ships. And then uh, map 11.5 on page 565 um, gives you an idea of his uh, voyages. And think about these voyages too, as you look at the the map, uh, the expeditions saw not really territorial expansion, but rather control over uh, trade and uh, tribute. So if you have your graphic organizer, we can 
recap that and get ready to look at uh, what's up ahead. Uh, crisis and recovery in Afro Eurasia. We talked about the collapse and consolidation, the spread of the Black Death, right? The foundation of it, famines, uh, droughts, and, and uh, cooler weather, right? Cooler weather via climate change. And uh, really glad to, to bring that up. I mean, climate change, we get the idea that this is some kind of a 20th century, 21st century uh, phenomenon, and it's not. It's been around since uh, uh, time began, right? Mother, Mother Nature, as they say, right, is uh, very big and um, powerful and um, changes over time, right? Has its cycles. So, but popular religious movements uh, in, in Europe um, and China emerge. Talked about the Islamic heartland, the Ottoman Empire. Ottomans um, build a new, uh, start building new mosques around this time. Um, they supported education, uh, acted as caretakers of Islam. Uh, the new political forces open up the way for the rise of the Ottomans. Uh, you have the Sultan, right? The Sultan is the defender of Islam, protected holy cities, and overall, is an overall military chief. If you were one of my live classes, we do some role plays, and uh, we get to this section, someone takes on the role of a Sultan. And then Western Christendom, the uh, Catholic Church, right? Catholic Church, state building and economic recovery. The uh, power of religious authority gets challenged. Uh, Western Europe experienced probably the greatest degree of social fragmentation. Heretics get persecuted and Christians overall are disappointed with the church. Then you have political consolidation and, and on the Iberian Peninsula, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, driving non-Catholics out of Spain. Um, they fund Columbus to gain wealth and spread Catholicism across Afro-Eurasia. Um, and then you have the, the rebuilding states. A European monarch ensued power via establishing rules of power, uh, claiming divine right, and aligning with political dynasties. And then the Renaissance, right? Ancient Greek and Roman art and learning uh, that challenges traditional sources of authority. And the printing press, right? Gives uh, voice to the masses and different political views and then those of the king. Ming China, uh, restoring order, the, the Ming dynasty replaced the Wan dynasty, uh, religion, elaborate rituals, and then trade. Zhang He, very super, uh, superstitious and, and suspicious of, uh, of foreign trade, leery of it um, corrupting Chinese culture. So there you have it. Let's take a look at what's up ahead and a lot of important stuff here that we have to uh, um, get straight here. And you know, the basics there you have, um, as you read to supplement the lecture, for those of you who are more independent or independent learners and, and uh, like, to, like to read and uh, read the material. Got some, yeah, again, some good videos there. Black Death, the Ottoman Empire, good laws and good arms. You need that stuff there to, um, if you certainly want to take the review quiz, and that's going to be available. This is one of the wrinkles. We have a short week. This is a short week. And um, because we're, you know, heading into the finals week. So the review quiz, if you're interested in taking that, that's going to be available on Wednesday through Friday. The posts, we have a short week. The posts, the initial post will be due on Wednesday, Wednesday night, and the response posts due uh, on Thursday at uh, midnight. I should probably make an annou announcement on this uh, on the course page. Friday is test three. Friday is test three. And then the final lurking 
right, lurking uh, ever so closely now. Tuesday, the 14th of December, uh, that will be available all day. I will let you know if you are exempt, right? If you have a 93.7 and above, you're exempt. Don't take anything for granted uh, until you hear from me. If you do not hear from me, you will be expected to take the final, right? Another way to look at that, if you're not taking it, if you don't have to take it, I will get a hold of you, okay? Any questions or comments on that? Um, you know how to get a hold of me, okay? Fantastic. So that kind of wraps it up, right? Last lecture. And uh, it's been um, a lot of fun covering this. And uh, it's been um, um, really great uh, interacting with um, uh, many of you who um, were um, in closer contact with me, I suppose, maybe than some others. So I uh, wish you guys uh, all the best. Do well down the home stretch here. And um, we'll um, hopefully talk to you down the line somewhere, okay? Thanks for taking my course. Bye.